Welcome back, Alex Tools. I'm Tom. So uh, we're going to try to do a uh, an episode, uh, a, a meatloaf episode, and uh, in commemoration of the new shop, we're going to call this Country Meatloaf, which uh, distinguishes distinguishes it from City Meatloaf, which isn't as good. And uh, right. So anyway, uh, we'll throw some stuff together uh, of interest. I got a. Uh, uh, I finished the uh, the lathe. Uh, um, backsplash thing. I've moved some machines around. Uh, I got a little book uh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, I found some old ancient uh, uh, paperwork that you guys might be interested in. So uh, we'll check it out and uh, try out a country meatloaf. See you in a minute. I almost forgot. Um, next weekend, which is February 19th, 2022, um, there's a little meet and greet, Northern California uh, chip breakers or whoever, you, whatever you want to call us. Uh, it's uh, San Francisco Bay Area uh, uh, YouTubers and metal workers. They get together for uh, meet and greet and swap meet. Uh, there's one on February 19th uh, at my friend Andy's shop in Benicia. So uh, if you're interested in, uh, in going or whatever, it's kind of an RSVP, so, uh, but uh, shoot me an email. And if you guys don't know my email address by now, um, it's in the beginning of all the videos, right in the front, and uh, it's on the screen. So it's pretty easy to find. Uh, shoot me an email, and then I'll, sh I'll send you a, uh, uh, the time and date and uh, and the location. So uh, and this is San Francisco Bay Area. So uh, Benicia, California, and February nineteenth, two thousand twenty-two. Bring a truckload of junk and uh, trade with other uh, uh, tool bugs and uh, machinery heads. So uh, it's a targeted audience. So uh, <laughs> you're pretty much guaranteed of uh, finding something cool and potentially selling off. Uh, uh, large quantities of rusty metal things. So uh, anyway, for, almost forgot about that. Uh. Okay, let's get the bag drill and see if we can drill some holes. It's a while to find stuff around here right now, you know, because everything's not put away yet. Um, so it took me a minute to find some cutting oil, believe it or not. And uh, I'm using a spiral point tap here and my little uh, gator tapping guide here, which works pretty good in tight quarters. So, this gets me started straight. And since it's a through hole, the spiral point tap really works good, pushing that chip ahead of the uh, uh, ahead of the the. Bit.
So that's uh, 3A16, which is about uh, equivalent to 10 millimeter um, thread. So now I got four threaded holes. I can uh, attach these brackets now. Get some fasteners and uh, let's get to it. Alright, let's square this bastard up. Sounds pretty solid. <clears throat> Alright, let's let's give it the let's give it the lard ass test. Oh yeah, I think that's I think that's gonna be adequate. You know, I almost got the double they have these that are double stacked, right? And then I said, you know, I don't think it's going to need that. And I was right. Roll that thing up like that. Maybe I ought to support it. You got to get a little clever with your, uh, your rigging and your... Uh, This, I guess, this is why people have kids, right? So that uh, they can uh, um, have them come down and give them a hand, right? <laughs> there we go, that's better. Yeah. The balance is a little bit better. I gotta get these unit strut knives in there. thing done. Um, I got back from Lowe's. I got a four foot LED fixture for uh, this replacing the old funky fluorescent one. So this came out pretty good. It's pretty sturdy. Pretty happy with the uh, rigidity of it. Um, I might add a brace to the, the tail end of it down there at some point in the future but we'll see how it is. Um, I won't be mounting the uh, the camera for a uh, lathe video on this. It's a little too wiggly for that. It'll pick up vibrations from the machine. So my guess is I'll have a tripod on this side and I'll be looking over the top of the machine. It actually might be a nicer setup for filming. So uh, we'll see. So anyway, that's kind of done. Uh, I'll mount the light another time. And uh, let's look at some other changes uh, that in the shop. Well, I pushed some more machines around. And uh, I've mentioned it before, but this area in this corner here, or this little bay, is where all the grinding equipment's going. Uh, so we've got surface grinders, and then belt sanders, and drill grinders, and that kind of stuff, uh, buffers. All kind of dust producing stuff uh, will be kind of far, as far away from the machine tool, or the other machine tools as I can get them. So I pushed uh, the Taft Pierce and the Brown and Sharp over here and uh, just to kind of see what they look like. And once again, these aren't final positions. These are kind of tryout positions uh, according to my layout. And uh, the brown and sharp actually needs to move over a little bit and go back a little further, about a foot and a half and a foot and a half in both directions, back and over. And then the tap pierce will kind of follow it and be parallel with it like it is. Um, and then, um, um, and then that'll kind of tidy that up, I think, a little bit. But once again, I, so I'm leaving them on blocks until I've got this insulation thing squared away. I've gotten one quote, and uh, I kind of don't like it. Um, and yeah, it's a big number. That's part of why I don't like it. But uh, um, also, uh, you know, I had some kind of basic questions on the quote, and uh, I'm getting crickets from the from the vendor. 
Um, so to me, that's not typically a good sign, you know, when you want to ask some basic questions like, okay, how much of that's materials? How much of that's labor? Because the quote wasn't broken down that way, right? So, um, um, you know, there's no, uh, we take care of this, we take care of that, you know. So it was basically just a, just a, a number, okay? And so I want to get a second quote, at least a second quote, um, and, uh, and then decide, uh, and I probably want to go look at a job that they've done and uh, just so that I can kind of evaluate it uh, myself. And, you know, if you're going to spend uh, uh, north of $15,000 uh, for insulation, uh, then uh, you want to make sure that uh, you're going to be happy with the job, right? So you want to do a little due diligence or whatever. So anyway, that said, uh, Everything's on block still so they can move it out of here quickly. I have one machine running here, and that's uh, the, uh, the Dual. Hey! So the Dual uh, is the first operational, you know, big machine in here. And it's actually, I've used it a few times to cut Unistrut and, uh, and things like that. So uh, it's kind of nice. And the reason is, is it's single phase. So, uh, it, you know, it was easy to plug in. <laughs> So I just had to get a different plug and then uh, Bob's your uncle and off I went. So, uh, but uh, if you're gonna have one saw operating, vertical bandsaw is probably a good one. So anyway, that's kind of the update on, uh, on moving junk around. Uh, I hung some more lights, but I might've mentioned that already. Uh, I can't remember. And I've ordered some more of these strip LEDs that are gonna go on the secondary beam back there. And uh, we'll get those up when they show up. So when you move, all kinds of weird stuff uh, comes out and sees the light of day again. So uh, we're going to take a peek at these. And what this is, is a, uh, um, these are all original hand sketches uh, by me, um, which I saved from all the, well, not all, many, many of the jobs that, uh, that I've worked on over the years. Um, most of these are pretty old. I think there's a date. An end date on this one is 1995 here, so it's that one's some date up to 1995, and then um, uh, I have to look. I, I used to, I dated all the drawings there. What's, it, what's that say there? Uh, I didn't have the year on it. Anyway, we, uh, just for fun, we're gonna we're gonna flip through there and find some uh, some goofy stuff because uh, I worked on plenty of. Plenty of weird stuff. Anyway, I, I part of me wants to just throw them out, right? And uh, but the other part of me is like, "Geez, that was like a lot of work. So uh, do I want to throw it out or what?" But what good is it, right, at this point, right? So, um, but anyway, let's flip through it. Let's have some fun and uh, take a look at some old hand sketches. So, um, like I said, I uh, I saved all my. Uh, uh, or a lot of my hand sketches, and I, I always like this uh, this engineer's uh, um, graph paper. So you can see it shows a uh, a light um, uh, quadrille, you know, uh, pattern, you know, a uh, square pattern, right on one side. So when you actually run a copy of this on the copy machine, um, the the squares don't reproduce, but they're there when you want to use them uh, for uh, doing your doing your sketch. And you can see on the other side, it's it's printed much more strongly. So uh, uh, these are these engineers' computation pads. Uh, Alvin makes them. National makes them. Um, and um, anyway, this this is this, I'm just going to flip through it, and uh, then we'll see if, if there's an interesting one. But these are all just. You know what's funny is uh, most of these. Oh, that one I do remember. A lot of these I just don't even. Uh, <laughs> they bring back no memories. <laughs> but that's a lot of hand sketching. I can tell you that. So calculations, um, probably field drawings in here. Grabber of some sort. Who knows? Who knows? And let me tell you, there's plenty of brackets in here, right? <laughs> if nothing else, what is that one? Pot gland, Delrin. Oh, Calrez O-ring. What the heck was I doing there? 
I don't know, Calrez O-rings. That must have been some kind of corrosion problem or something. Interesting. I wonder why I was... <laughs> now I got... Uh, now you got me curious. So, uh, anyway, uh, kind of fun. Uh, not much use now other than kind of historical, right? You know, I suppose I could... Uh, I could sign and frame and print these uh uh and and uh <laughs> sell them off you know uh one at a time right let's see what else we got in here so what was that oh that was some plate uh, de deflection thing or something so uh that was, uh, I think that was for a, a powder press. We were making uh, uh, tablets um, out of a p particular chemical blend, and uh, we had to support the uh, um, the the die set uh, over an opening, and uh, we were worried about the uh, we were worried about uh, plate deflection there. So we did some did some math for that. So um, yeah. And then, you know, what you do in the end is you go, uh, an inch is strong enough, yeah, just make it two inches. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's a bunch of old sketches, and um, all these went out to the shop, or m many of them went out to the shop, and got built. Let's see. Let's see. What else we got here? Oh, hey, a CAD drawing. Oh, my God. How do you like that? So keep in mind, uh, this is when we couldn't afford uh, 3D drafting packages at the place I was working, right? So a lot of this stuff was just, um, you know, the quickest way to get it done, right? And um, I was just to hand sketch it, get it out to the shop and get working on it and uh, modify from there if necessary. But uh, um, now all this goes into, you know, goes into CAD and uh, there's... Uh, analysis and uh, you know many other things going on anyway kind of fun uh, walk down memory lane there's a uh, work order number 3908 uh, no date on that one so here we used to stamp them Let's see if I can find one there yeah so uh, 3877 is a work order project name the date oh that's 02 uh, material quantity and then um, Whoever fabricated this, they would, uh, uh, if they were on the stick, they would just log some hours on there just for, uh, and then all this went back in the master file, and then if we did that job again, we would pull this out and uh, take a look at some of the some of the bits and pieces, so, uh, um, okay, well, who knows. Anyway, geez, maybe I had to look through these things a little more, so, <laughs> funny games. So I did find one of interest here, actually poking around, um, and I remember I actually remember what this one was for here. So this is an interesting uh, mechanism, right? And what it was was so these are these are two air cylinders here. Um, there's one air cylinder here, and there's one air cylinder here. These are rodless air cylinders, and these are the shuttles on the air cylinders, right? So the idea was uh, we wanted a device that closed uniformly, right? And it was for grabbing a bottle um, um, and then squeezing that bottle under some air pressure, right? But if you played with air cylinders, um, and this all had to be non-electric because it was explosive materials, so it was uh, pneumatically operated. Um, so um, it's pretty hard to synchronize one side with the other, right, with, an air, with two separate air cylinders. Now, they make grabbers and stuff, but we had a particular space envelope we were dealing with. So what we did here is attach to each um, uh, moving member on the rodless cylinder, there, there was a piece of uh, gear rack and then an idler gear and another piece of gear rack, so one on, one on top of the other. So what these did was keep these two sides synchronized to one another so that it closed about a, a center line, right? That's what it was about. Um, and this was all inside a, a Pelican case. It was a portable system for opening um, uh, reactive or potentially explosive uh, chemicals uh, from a distance. Anyway, a little project I worked on for a hazardous waste company. So, uh, but yeah, I saw that and I went, oh, wow. That sketch took me a minute, so, uh, um, yeah. Yeah. 
anyway, that, that one was uh, worth a little discussion. So this next one uh, is kind of interesting. Um, my parents have a, uh, outside their house, they have one of those little, uh, uh, it's kind of like a neighborhood library. You know, basically it's a box where people can put books and stuff like that. And uh, you, you put a book in and you take a book out kind of a thing, right? So it's a free library, right? Anyway, this thing showed up in there and they pulled it out for me uh, when they saw it. And, um, and I said, oh, okay, that's cool. And, you know, I probably have 10 things that are very similar to this. Um, but I started flipping through it and there was actually a couple of interesting things in it that uh, I thought it'd be worth sharing. Uh, and, uh, and I got a couple of things flagged here. So let's just take a look at it. You know, and this is kind of a standard Cleveland twist drills, um, you know, speeds and feeds, blah, 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 um, stuff like that. Uh, but I came across a term that I hadn't heard before, which is kind of cool. And uh, so they're talking about uh, selecting cutting fluids, right? You know, and a lot of these old timey books have uh, some pretty crazy stuff in it, you know, sperm oil mixed with uh, with lard and uh, and baking soda and, and uh, hog fat uh, makes an excellent you know lube for uh, you know drilling <laughs> cast iron or something right um, but uh, and, and this is kind of like that here but uh, the thing that I came across that I hadn't heard before um, so here's copper right soluble oil winter strained lard oil oleic acid compounds, right? So I had never heard of winter strain lard oil. And uh, so I was like, oh, what is that, right? And I'm still not 100% positive. And um, um, it, but I believe it's a preparation method. And um, so that it's strained when it, you know, traditionally in the winter time or at a certain temperature or something like that. So, uh, um, anyway, I thought that was kind of interesting. So if anybody knows anything about winter strain lard oil, um, there, you know, you can find it on the web, but, um, I didn't find any references to how it's processed, right? Or how it's made, right? How they take the lard and winter strain it or whatever, whatever that means. Right. So, uh, um, and then the other, th the other thing that this had, it has a really good little section on small drills and, uh, which is, uh, something we've all kind of struggled with, right? Um, let's see, drilling of small diameter holes. And then it has a, a, a good section here and, uh, and talks about some of the, um, um, the problems in, you know, behind drilling with tiny drills, right? You know, their diameter to length ratio is, is more severe than normal drills, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a couple of cool takeaways here uh, that I picked up on here. And they're talking about cutting speeds and, and feeds. And, um, um, and something that I never really considered, but I know, uh, you know, mentally I kind of know it, right? Is proportionally the web in a small drill, we're talking 15 thousandths type, diameter type drills, you know, under a 16th, right? Proportionally, the web is a lot thicker in relation to the diameter on a small drill than it is on a, on a bigger drill. And it's just because they just can't make drills with really thin webs, right? So it's got more, more frontal area when you're, when you're trying to penetrate. And um, so what they're advocating here is to, yeah, try to follow the cutting speed, right? But um, it's about the chip formation, right? Is what really what you're looking at. So, uh, so produce chips, not powder. Uh, so that's kind of the takeaway there, right? Um, you know, they go through a little calculation for a number 70 drill, which at 80 surface feet per minute would be 11,000 RPM, right? And five thousandths of an inch per revolution um, feed, right? Well, you're not going to get five and a half inches a minute out of a, a, a number 70 drill, right? So their point is um, um, is uh, to reduce the speed and retain the feed per revolution until a satisfactory penetration rate is found, and then uh, look at the ch look at the chips. So get chips, not powder. Um, so and then the other thing that I've actually never seen in and once again you learn this by breaking a lot of drills and having a lot of trouble is when you're doing deep hole drilling, um, 
you should reduce the speed and the feed in relation to the number, you know, the, uh, the diameter to depth ratio of the hole, right? So you kind of know this. So the way I think about it is, you know, if you only have a little bit of drill engaged in the hole, there's not a lot of surface area rubbing on the hole. But as you get more drill in the hole, right, you have this a much larger kind of frictional area, right? So when you have deep holes, you should slow the, um, the, sp the uh, cutting speed down and uh, slow the feed rate down. And they actually give some guidelines here. Uh, three times drill, drill diameter, reduce 10% speed. Uh, six to eight times drill diameter reduced by 35 to 40 percent, right? And then the uh, the depth of the hole, five to eight times drill diameter reduced 20 percent on uh, on the feed too. So, uh, and I, I may have seen this at some point before, but I, I don't, I can't ever think of seeing that in one of these kind of drill books like this before. So anyway, I kind of thought that was cool. Um, and then they talk about the point types, you know, split points for, for small holes and small deep holes. So almost, uh, it, almost all um, small hole drilling is considered deep hole drilling because the diameters are so small and, um, you know, you're doing multiple uh, depth or multiple diameter depths, right? So it's all pretty much classified as, uh, as deep hole drilling. Anyway, so it's kind of a... Kind of a cool book, Drilling of Armor Plate, in case you uh, need to do that. Uh, I know that comes up for me pretty regularly. So, uh, and then, oh, molded plastics. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen that drill tip before. So if you buy a, uh, a set of drills, especially for plastic, you'll see that it has this very kind of acute point on it in, um, um, for, for doing plastics, right? Center drills, what else we got? Four flute drills, stuff like that. And then in the back here is the classic picture. This is an almost, uh, oh yeah, here, here's, the, uh, here's the web. So the web is tapered in a drill, right? So as you cut the drill down, uh, the web gets thicker and thicker and thicker as you get near the base of the drill, right? So you have to thin the web. Um, but there's a picture in here that's pretty much in every drill sharpening. Um, let's see if I can find it here. Oh, here it is. So this one here, and this is a drill that's been that's been broken here, and you'll find this picture of this dude's hands here, uh, with holding this broken piece of drill in pretty much every like college textbook or uh, handbook on drilling and stuff like that. Uh, they all borrowed this picture, right? They like this picture for some reason. So, and uh, anyway, so uh, Cleveland twist drill. Uh, I don't know. There's much information on it. Good luck finding one here. Um, jump on eBay real quick before everybody else. Ha, ha, ha. And see if you can find one before, uh, before they're all gone. Or maybe, um, uh, maybe what we'll do is uh, if somebody wants to scan this one and then we'll make a PDF out of it, then we'll give it to Keith Rucker and have him put it up on his uh, uh, vintagemachinery.org. And uh, then everybody can get at it. So... But uh, I don't have time to scan it, so if somebody wants to scan it, I'll mail it to them, and, uh, and uh, they can scan it and make a PDF out of it. So this is the next one I want to show you. So now that I'm a, uh, a country boy, you pretty much got to have a chainsaw. But uh, um, I was kind of resistant to uh, getting a two-stroke chainsaw, even though you know, their you know, power to weight ratio is probably better than a, than a battery powered one, which this one's electric here, just to clarify. Um, so, you know, we have solar panels and all that. So our electricity is actually really cheap. Um, so I said, you know what? I don't, really don't feel like messing around with premix and spark plugs and gasoline and all that stuff. And this got pretty good reviews, um, just reading online. And you can see I've been using it. And I'll tell you what, I'm like super happy with this thing. And uh, this is a XCU04 16 inch Makita chainsaw. And it uh, uses two 18 volt batteries. So it's a 36 volt system. And, uh, and I'll tell you what, this thing rocks out. I've been cutting, uh, you know, we had a big storm up here, and so a bunch of branches fell down and whatnot. And um, um, so, uh, um, 
I've been cutting stuff up. It's pretty good. So he uses a uh, kind of a narrow chain um, uh, compared to a normal chainsaw. I believe it's a little narrower, but uh, um, I, that's functionally the only difference between it and a, and a regular chainsaw. So this one, it's pretty light and for a 16 inch bar. And um, so anyway, I'm just telling you guys about it. And uh, uh, if, if you're kind of on the fence about a electric power chainsaw, uh, I'm gonna say for a non-professional use, you know, you're not a, a, a tree feller or a forester or whatever, right? You gotta, got some property, you got limbs and trees to cut up a little bit, um, then uh, this is completely adequate and uh, will uh, uh, probably do you just fine. So let's go find something to cut because that's the fun part. And uh, who, you know, who doesn't like a good excuse to get a new tool, right? So uh, uh, let me just turn it on. And the other thing is it's quiet, okay? It's fairly quiet uh, uh, compared to a gas-powered chainsaw. And no, you know, yanking your arm out of the socket uh, to get it going when it has what's been sitting in the garage for, uh, you know, a year. So let's go cut something. I don't know if this is a, a good test. These are some, uh, they're kind of punky. Uh, uh, I believe they're pine. Uh, so it's probably not a, a great test, you know, as far as... Uh, hardwoods and things like that but it's uh it's available this is down the road uh from my shop here so uh with an electric chainsaw uh, it's okay to wear shorts just kidding you really want long pants uh ideally kevlar pants uh that's where you get hurt with the chainsaw in the legs um but uh we're gonna do a little sample cut here and see what happens, so. Okay. Makita. pretty good this is probably not a great log for testing uh, but it's pretty good size you know it's 20 inches or something like that um, and you know somebody asked me they go oh well, how long does the battery last and I said about as long as I do so uh, that's my answer and um, I'm giving this uh, two thumbs up from Tom uh, Makita XCU04 16 inch cordless chainsaw. Welcome back to the shop. I saw this piece over here off to the side. Uh, so this is uh, this is oak. Uh, this is kind of seasoned oak that's been sitting here for a while. I'm not going to cut all the way through because it's in the dirt, but uh, we'll do a little cutting on it to uh, demonstrate. Now, 
I've annoyed the ants here, so, uh, um, but you, you know, you get the idea, right? It actually cuts pretty good. So if you got uh, limbs to get rid of or bodies to dispose of, uh, this might be your friend. <laughs>